Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'd like to start our conversation on the question of um, responsible business as a movement. So I think what I'd like to hear from you about um, is what you think sort of catalyzed the modern responsible business movement um, after ESG began as something that was sort of more on the fringe and is now part of the mainstream. Okay, well, first of all, Andrew, thank you very much for having, uh, having me, and uh, thank you for coming along uh, this afternoon. I'm sorry that the number of speakers has been somewhat depleted, and you're going to have to listen to me. Uh, but anyway, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to having an active conversation. So I hope you're all going to join in, you know, and raise questions uh, as we're going. I know we're going to have a Q&A at the end. Um, but let's make this as interactive as we possibly can. Okay, so um, business is going through one of its most profound changes. Uh, it's a sort of change that happens approximately every 60 years, and I'll describe what happened about 60 years ago uh, as the predecessor to what's going on now. Basically, Business is one of the most important institutions in our lives. It clothes, feeds and houses us, employs us, and it invests our savings. It's the source of economic prosperity and the growth of nations around the world. And, and just before I go any further, how many of you are associated in some way or another with the business school here in Oxford? Okay, quite, quite, quite a reasonable proportion of it, so of you, so you know a little bit about the background uh, to which I'm going to be talking. Uh, so it, it's contributed an immense amount to our lives. But at the same time, it's been a source of growing environmental degradation, inequality, social exclusion, and mistrust. And let me just illustrate this by telling you about a, a survey that a market research company, Ipso Mori, does every year, and it's done so for the last 40 years, in which they ask a 1,000 people in England, in the, in the UK, every year, which professions do they trust to tell the truth? Now, alongside doctors, teachers, and nurses that appear at the top of the list that people trust, I'm pleased to say come university professors. We, we might not have much power, pay, or prestige, but at least people trust us to do nothing, earn nothing, and take no credit for it. Now, at, at, at the other end of the table come business leaders, just ahead of estate agents, professional footballers, journalists, and rock bottom, I'm sure you can guess it, come politicians. They come below bankers, trade union officials, and the man and woman in the street. And they've been close to the bottom for nearly every one of the 40 or so years of the survey. So mistrust in business is profound, pervasive, and persistent. Now, why is this the case? I'd suggest to you the reason is what is sometimes termed the Friedman Doctrine after Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, who said in 1960 that there is one and only one social purpose of business, to increase profits so long as it stays within the rules of the game, by which he meant basically the law and regulation. Beyond that, it was the job of firms, and in particular, the directors of companies who ran them, to maximize profits as much as possible. Now, that has been the basis of business 
practice, policy, and education ever since. And it's really the basis of a lot of the problems that I was just describing. But it hasn't always been like that, because business started really in the form of the corporation in ancient Rome 2,000 years ago as the Societas Publicanorum, which was an organization that was designed as a corporation in pretty much the form that we think about corporations today, but to undertake very public functions of collecting taxes, minting coins, looking after public buildings. And for nearly all of its 2,000-year history, the corporation has combined a public purpose with the notion of making money. And that's very important to bear in mind when we think about what's going on at the moment because it's only over the last 60 years since the Friedman Doctrine was first stated that the notion that the one and only social purpose of business is to increase profits, in other words, the only purpose of business is to make money, has arisen. Okay, so it's not something that is inherent to the corporation or business. In fact, what is inherent to the corporation and business and the reason why it was established in the first place was to make money, but to do so on the basis of doing some public good, some public purpose. Now, what's going on at the moment is a re-examination of the Friedman Doctrine and in many places, a rejection of that proposition in favor of the notion that actually we have to think about, yet again, the role of business in society. That's basically what people mean when they talk about responsible business. And over the last few years, we've seen a dramatic change in attitude. In 2019, Larry Fink, the CEO and president of BlackRock, the largest investment management business in the world with something like $10,000 trillion of assets under management, said that every business needs to have a purpose, not a strap line or a marketing campaign, but a statement of its fundamental reason for being. Purpose, he said, is not the sole pursuit of profits, but the animating force for achieving them. And in 2019, we had the Business Roundtable, which is the American organization for some of the largest companies in the world, particularly based in the US, which stated that it was dropping its notion of the purpose of business as being about maximizing profits in favor of one that said the purpose of business is to deliver value for customers, to invest in employees, to support societies, to care for communities, and to deliver long-term value for shareholders. And what is happening now is that companies Investors, governments are realizing that actually the purpose of business is not the Friedman Doctrine notion, but it's a notion of how can business really serve us as individuals, communities, societies, and the natural world. And the way in which I define the notion of a purpose of a business is to help us solve problems, problems that we face as individuals, societies, and the natural world. And to do so in a particular way, because business is not about charity. 
It's about making money. And profit is essential for a business. And it's a very important notion of being sustainable, that it's not dependent on charity. It's not dependent on taxation for allowing it to survive. It can generate the resources that it requires to sustain its activities for the indefinite future. So the way in which I define the purpose of a business is to produce profitable solutions for the problems of people and planet, not profiting from producing problems for either, producing profitable solutions for the problems of people and planet, not profiting from producing problems for either. And that, I believe, is what should be the way in which we conceive of a purpose of a business. Because the purpose of a business is the reason why it exists, why it's created, its reason for being. So it's a very fundamental concept. And that, to my mind, is what one should think about when one's conceiving, creating a company as an entrepreneur, as a startup organization, or when one's running the largest companies in the world, the Microsofts, the Apples, the Googles as well. It's applicable right across the board. So you talk about these firms who are coming to the realization and approaching a less profit-centered model. Um, what do you think is the best way to motivate those firms that aren't making this realization to move in the direction you're talking about? That there are two things, one of which is, you say, a rebalancing to a model that involves less profit. That's possibly the case, but it's not necessarily the case. And in many instances, people argue, well, actually, it's not a trade-off. It's not a sacrifice. If we go back to that statement by the Business Roundtable, they were talking about delivering value for customers, investing in employees, etc., and delivering long-term value for shareholders. It wasn't either or, it was both and. And so, from the perspective of some parties, this is not a matter of sacrificing profits. On the contrary, it's a mechanism for delivering greater value for shareholders as well as greater benefits for societies, communities, and the natural world. And I really want to emphasize or illustrate why that's the case. So come back to this notion of what I've been describing as being the purpose of a business as profitably solving problems. The first thing to notice about this is it's not a marketing slogan. It's not about looking good or promotion of the business. It's about the core activity of what a business does, as Larry Fink was saying, on a day-to-day -day basis. It should be the basis of the strategy, the way in which a company formulates its strategy and implements its strategy in its business. The notion of solving problems is very precise. It's about what problems a company is solving, for whom, how does it solve those problems, when is it going to solve those problems, and why is it particularly well suited to solve those problems. Okay? Now, I want to illustrate this in relation to an example. And the example I'm going to take is of a Danish pharmaceutical company called Novo Nordisk, which produces insulin. Insulin is used in the treatment of diabetes, both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And until a few years ago, Novo Nordisk argued that its purpose was simply to produce insulin. 
Now, that's not a purpose in the way in which I was just describing it in terms of solving problems. It's a description of what it does. And it began to realize that actually that statement of its purpose was not adequate. Why? Because 80% of type 2 diabetes is found in low and middle income countries, many of which could not afford to purchase its insulin. So it began to think again about, well, what is its purpose? And it concluded that its purpose was to help people treat type 2 diabetes. So it started working with universities, doctors, and hospitals around the world to identify the best ways in which type 2 diabetes could be treated in different parts of the world. And then it realized, well, actually, there was even more to its purpose than that. That it, it shouldn't only help people treat type 2 diabetes, it should help them avoid getting type 2 diabetes in the first place. And so it started working with governments, local authorities, health workers in different countries to identify the changes in lifestyles which would help people avoid getting type 2 diabetes in the first place. Now, you might say, that's all very well, all very noble and worthy, but does it not fundamentally undermine the business model of Novo Nordisk of selling insulin? And the answer is no. Its business has thrived on the back of it. And why? Because in the process of building up those relations with governments, local health workers, hospitals, doctors, etc. It established relationships of trust where those parties trusted it to provide the advice and the products that would help people. And in the process of building up those relations of trust, it became trusted not only in the supply of insulin and advice on type 2 diabetes, but in terms of the delivery of all manners of health products, services, and advice. Now, I think that brings out two very important elements. The first is the importance of having that clarity as to what your purpose really is. Really understanding why do you exist as a company. It's quite useful as individuals for us to think about why do we exist, and what is our purpose? But it's particularly important for companies because they are such large and powerful organizations in many instances. And the second point is that if you can bring that clarity and a commitment to delivery of that purpose, then it creates one of the most valuable assets that a company can have and that is to be trusted, to be seen to be trustworthy. Because at the end of the day, virtually all commercial relationships depend on trust. Now, as a law student, you'll have discussed a lot about commercial contracts and things like that and the emphasis we place on contracting. And you'll also realize the severe limitations there are to contracts and specifying contracts and the enforceability of those contracts. And that means that although we may formally have contracts in many instances, at the end of the day, it's a matter of trust, a matter of to what extent can we trust the other party to really fulfill what they say they're going to do. And so that really is one of the reasons why this notion of thinking about having a purpose that goes beyond just making money to how you make the making of that money an outcome or a product of solving problems. The solving problems is the factor that drives the profits and the profits should be derivative of 
solving those problems. So you've spoken about how finding and pursuing a purpose um, can turn corporations into a force for good and a force for problem solving. Do you think that similar incentives exist for corporations to reduce the harm that they cause, whether that be environmental or with respect to human rights? Absolutely. Uh, and let me just remind you of the fact that there were two parts to my statement as to what a purpose of a business is. Is. The first part is to produce profitable solutions to the problems of people and planet. That's, if you like, the positive element. And the other, the second part, is the non-negative element. And not to profit from producing problems for either people or planet. And that what that means is that companies should not derive profits from creating environmental degradation or human rights abuses. And that a fundamental principle that should be driving the behavior of companies is that their financial incentives are aligned with us as individuals societies and the natural world in terms of upholding not just the environment but nature more generally in terms of biodiversity for example and our not just our individual human rights but the rights that we derive from being members of communities and societies around the world and so what this is doing is to say not only should business be, as you've just described it, a force for good and have a strong incentive to be a force for good because its profits derive then from the good that it's doing, but also that it should be clearly not incentivized to being a force for bad. And that, to my mind, is why we've got to the fundamental dilemma that we're currently in. Because regrettably, we fail to realize that in the process of incentivizing companies to invest and innovate, we're not only encouraging them to solve problems, but we're also encouraging them to make money from creating problems. And we see that in spades. That is precisely what is going on in terms of environmental degradation. It's the problem that is, in economic terms, normally described as being the externality. It's the bit that companies profit from because they do not incur the costs of cleaning up the mess that they create. They are not required to internalize those externalities unless regulation or the law specifically demands that of them. And in most cases, the law is incapable of enforcing that because there isn't the ability of legal systems and cross-jurisdiction legal systems to provide a mechanism for their enforcement. So not just in relation to environment, but in relation to human rights, to avoidance of modern slavery, of discrimination in the workplace, of abuse of particular communities, we are observing that companies are not profiting simply from producing solutions, they are in many cases profiting at the expense of others. What is often termed wealth transfer, not wealth creation. That you profit by transferring wealth from someone who's suffering the environmental pollution or the part of nature that's suffering the loss of the biodiversity. 
to the company and to the shareholders and to the people who are running those companies. Now that is not by any legitimate notion of a profit, a true profit. And one of the fundamental problems that we've got is we have not defined the notion of a profit appropriately to align it with our interests as individual societies in the natural world. So you talk about the shortfalls that regulation has when dealing with these issues and dealing with the question of how to prevent companies from creating these externalities. Um, do you believe there is hope for law as a regulatory tool in addressing this issue? Well, not only do I believe that there is hope, there is also necessity. It's absolutely essential that law ensures that what I am describing as being the purpose of a business becomes an integral part of a business. Now, you, you slightly conflated two notions in the question when you talked about law and regulation. You know, law and regulation overlap, but they are distinct. And as I was describing in relation to the Friedman Doctrine, Friedman did not dispute the notion that companies have to abide by regulation, what he terms the rules of the game. But the problem, as I've just described it, is regulation is a very weak tool for controlling the behavior of companies. Some people describe businesses, in particular large businesses, as being psychopathic. They are exploitative, manipulative, and corrosive. They're exploitative in terms of what I've just described as being profiting at the expense of others, that wealth transfer. They're manipulative in turning things like regulation to their advantage. And we see that going on all the time in particular in the United States, where lobbying by the corporate giants is regarded as being just part of the political system. But more generally, business is very good at, in essence, ensuring that the worst aspects of regulation from their points of view are diluted. That's what we saw again in spades after the financial crisis, that we started off with ideas around stringent regulation of the banks, which then got gradually watered down under the vociferous complaints that came from banks, so that they're manipulative in that sense, and they are finally corrosive in the sense that they undermine our moral principles and ethical notions in terms of the pursuit of money instead of morals. They undermine what it is for us to be human, notions of care, kindness, and consideration for simply the notion of the pursuit of money. Now, some people hold them to that view that business is essentially psychopathic. Now, I don't believe that that is in general the case. There are examples of that, and we'll all be very aware of one very recent prominent example of it, which has been widely documented now, namely Purdue Pharma, the producer of OxyContin, the drug that is used as a very powerful painkiller, which has been the basis of the opioid epidemic, in particular in the United States, but globally as well, and the death of literally hundreds of thousands of people. Now, that's an extreme example of a company whose activities have had devastating effects on individuals and societies. 
and you may have observed how despite what has happened in that company, the extent to which the consequence has been in terms of the penalties imposed on the business and on the owners of the company are regarded by many people as being seriously inadequate. So what we see is that regulation is not an adequate tool. So what do we need to do? What we need to do is to recognize that the problem is not having external rules and regulations that try and constrain the behavior of companies, but to change the intrinsic nature of companies. What they perceive and recognize as being their reason for being. What are they there to do? And we then have to recognize that a basis on for, for what we think that companies should be doing is to help solve problems and to do so in a way that's profitable, but to align their generation of profit with solving those problems. And that means we fundamentally have to change the nature of corporate law as it's described in the United States or company law as it's described in Britain, in embedding this notion of the purpose of a company within company and corporate law in place of the current notion that the purpose of a business is to, produce, to promote the success of the company for the benefit of what in Britain is termed its members, namely the shareholders in the firm. One should recognize that the purpose of the company should be, as I've described it, to solve problems profitably, not profiting from producing problems. That would fundamentally change the nature of business around the world. When companies go to, to form these purposes and potentially draft them in a legal context, what do you think is the process by which they should do so? Um, and how does that influence the outcome? What would happen under this basis is that companies would be, first of all, required to specify their purpose. And for that purpose to be embedded in the articles of association of the company. It would then become the fiduciary responsibility of the directors of the company to not only state the purpose, but to uphold it and to demonstrate that they are doing so. What does that mean? It means that the company would have to show that the whole constitution of the firm was aligned with its purpose. The constitution in the sense of the nature of the ownership of the firm, the governance of the firm, namely the responsibilities of the directors to different parties in the firm, and in terms of the way in which it measures its performance. So it would have to demonstrate that not only is the board of directors of the company dedicated to delivering that purpose, but so too are the people who own the company, the shareholders, that they recognize their responsibilities for ensuring that the company is delivering that purpose and that they are not profiting by the company creating detriments for others. And the governance of the company would require that the directors not only are accountable to the shareholders as they are at present, but they are accountable to those parties on whom they depend, most particularly the employees in the company, and on whom they impact. That is to say, not just the customers who buy their products, 
but also the communities who live around the factories of the company or the communities that are affected by the environmental degradation that the firm creates. The firm would be accountable to those parties on whom it depends and impacts as well as to its shareholders. And it would be responsible to those parties for ensuring that it is not profiting from producing detriments. Now you might say, well, isn't this going to be extremely difficult and costly for a firm to engage with those parties? But just go back to that example of Novo Nordis that I gave you, where it realized that actually what it was doing was impacting not just on its current customers, but in particular on those who were not its customers. Because a key part of what it was doing was failing to alleviate the problems that many of the people who were most in need of its products could not afford to purchase. So that its impact was in terms of who should it be able to access its products and afford its products who presently were unable to do so. And so that process of engaging with governments and local authorities and health workers, etc., brought it into contact with those parties who potentially could benefit from its activities and ultimately helped it contribute to make it into a more profitable organization. So far from this just being a, an additional cost on companies, it's actually the source of the improved performance of the firm as well. And finally then, the notion of measuring performance should be against not just what are the profits it's generating, but to what extent is it really solving the problems that it claims it's solving, and is it really clean, cleaning up the mess that it's creating in terms of the detriments as well as the benefits it's causing? I think we can move to an audience Q&A. Is there anyone who would like to? Farad. Sure. Yeah, in front. Um, just um, three questions, um, which have emerged naturally over the course. Of, sorry. Three questions which have at least for me emerged um, naturally over, over the course of, of your um, erudite um, submissions. The first is um, I would ask, are you at all concerned about um, an ideological monopoly somewhat taking over the marketplace on account of the financial economies of scale it would have access to if it were to have uh, unmitigated support from institutions as large as BlackRock, uh, for example, the second being that um, would you be at all concerned about government failures being translated into the market and the firms that would be supported precisely because of the intersection between uh, those likely to stock ESG departments and those likely to also stock uh, government bureaucracies and the similar incentives which might be at play? And thirdly, I, I'm also a law student and um, the bit about incorporating uh, statements of purpose into law spoke to me and, and one thing that jumped to mind was that's potentially vulnerable to Goodhart's law and the idea of um, specified criteria becoming vulnerable to iteration over time because presumably if that statement of purpose were to be enshrined with according uh, legal rights to to action then what assuming Goodhart's law still applies and that the surrounding forces would still attempt to iterate the application of that statement for maximum gain uh, one might run the danger of increasing the costs with fixing whatever iterations later become uh, productive or even non-productive or even disadvantageous later down the line. Okay, uh, so first of all, ideologies in relation to large, powerful financial institutions. They're not necessarily inherently a bad thing. Uh, and indeed, we benefit immensely from the services that the likes of Fidelity, BlackRock, and Vanguard providers. Uh, any of you who are investing in stock markets 
will probably be using them in one form or another as remarkably low-cost vehicles for diversifying your portfolios across the world. And, and that has been a fantastic contribution to the savings potential of people across the world. So, so you shouldn't just regard this as being the, you know, the nasty large institution. What one needs to think about is how does one really ensure that the interests of those institutional investors like BlackRock are aligned with what I'm talking about in terms of delivering benefit. And that's why people are really focusing on the statement that Larry Fink was making, because it has an element of an enlightenment to it that we do not, unfortunately, see enough of amongst the institutional community. And that is precisely what, to my mind, I think one needs to encourage. In terms of government uh, and the extent to which this gives rise to potential abuse in relation to government engagement, in essence, what this is talking about is by making it intrinsic to a company and diminishing the reliance we therefore place on external regulatory requirements. We're really saying that this is a diminution of the dependency of us as societies and the natural world on the governments of the world to be able to address this issue. And that, I think, is critically important because we're seeing increasingly the failure of governments, the contradictions that we associate with the best or the worst democratic systems in the world, and the ability to really ensure that the corporate sector's interests are aligned with us. And in fact, I would argue, and others are arguing as well, that a lot of the problems that we're facing currently with our democratic systems is because of the fact that the abuses that are increasing within the corporate sector are putting intolerable burdens and strains on the democratic system in which we are relying on governments to control companies simply to the extent that they are not capable of doing within well-functioning democratic systems. And thirdly, your point about Goodhart's law, uh, and to what extent, if one measures uh, something, does that then mean that it is the source of the failure of that which one measures? The answer is that, yes, there is a risk of this, but what we're talking about is, in essence, not defining, not simply laying down what the measures are. In fact, what we're observing under the current system by which companies are profit-maximizing we're seeing increasing introduction of global standards of setting measures, ESG, environmental, social, and governance measures, which are supposed to be standards across all companies. What we need is something which says companies should define the criteria by which they need to measure their performance to establish whether or not they really are delivering on their purposes. So far from saying, here is a measure or a set of measures that we're going to impose and will therefore, according to good arts law, eventually fail, we're saying it's up to those who are delivering these supposed benefits to define how those performances should be evaluated. I think that is all that we have time oh, for. Oh, right. Okay, so we've only had time for one question. <laughs> <I guess>. um, <laughs> Sorry about that. But thank you very much for your pleasure. time and for your comments and you. for the one question that we did <laughs> get to answer. All right. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. And thank you for hosting it. Much very appreciated. Very happy to.